right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Cornerstone Wealth Financial and Market Update. I'm Jeff Carbone, a founding member and managing partner at Cornerstone. I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, today, uh, our Chief Investment Officer, Cliff Hodge, as you all know, will share uh, some thoughts, review our investment process first, and it's always good to do a quick review. But look at 2022 so far, do a review of the market outlook, uh, kind of discuss, of course, what everybody probably wants to know, where are we positioning and what are the implications that we see? And then I'll come back in uh, at the end it's, if we have some time, just do a few uh, market updates and or financial updates and tax planning strategies. So a lot to go over, Cliff, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us. And, and more importantly, thank you for letting us come and work for you uh, each and every day. It's times like these where we, where we really earn our stripes. And yeah, I just want to kick us off because I know that it's been an incredibly challenging time. There's, there's been extreme volatility in the markets and uncertainty pervades. And it's not just in financial markets, but, but also for our country with elections right around the corner and, and on the global stage, Russia, China, everything in between, frays a lot of nerves and uh, causes a lot of gray hairs, as Jeff can attest. <laughs> we feel it too. Look, we're all human. We're all emotional creatures and, and we invest alongside our clients. And so we get it. We, we understand. And, and while many might be thinking about throwing in the towel and, and selling out, you know, anything to make it stop, right? It, it could provide a little bit of comfort in the short term, but, but just remember that the market has an uncanny ability to, to push us right to that breaking point before it turns on a dime. I mean, just look at today. We were, we were down uh, 2% this morning after the inflation number and, and ended the day up near three. And, and so um, it's always difficult, right? Because after you decide to, to sell out at a loss, then you've got another almost impossible decision to make. And that's when you get back in. And, and by the time the dust settles and, and you're comfortable enough to, to wade back out into the waters, so to say, you've missed the meat of the move. So the, the selling's already been done. You know, we're, we're closer to the bottom than, than we are to the top, right? And, and that's why we do what we do. That, that's why we, we created and we rely on our process for times just like this. And so we feel feelings, but we don't do feelings. We, we do process. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So maybe Jeff, that's a good Good place to, to kick it yeah, off. Yeah. Let me share and, my and, screen. Yeah, that's perfect, Cliff. If you share and uh, just as you're pulling that up, again, as we again, thank you for everybody for joining. Of course, we're going to be recording the session uh, today, as we always do. We'll re we'll post it to the website. We'll send out an email uh, after uh, everything is edited and completed, um, and then cer we we certainly hope that you share it with friends and family because, like Cliff said, there's a lot of emotions out there. We know that. We understand that uh, we're here. That's why we do the web these webinars to uh, to help give you some education and some thoughts of what we're seeing. Um, so again, pass along or send that out uh, to anybody that you, family, colleagues, friends that you think could could use it right now. Um, as always, we'll also take maybe try and take a few questions. So if there are any questions at the end. Uh, go to the question box and, and put it in and put your question in and we'll see if we can get that answer today. So uh, Cliff, why don't, uh, if you get us started and with kind of just, maybe let's review kind of like we said, you can take go through the agenda of what you want to go, but kind of want you to start with us going through our investment process. And I think you have it here. And then just really kind of an update of what we've seen so far here in 2022. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jeff. So uh, as you said, we'll, we'll start with a quick review of the process. We'll look at 2022 before, before then turning to the outlook. And I, I'm pretty excited to, to introduce a, a new dashboard that we've been working on behind the scenes that, that really talks about the three key pillars uh, of our investment process. And this is nothing new. These are all things that we've done for the past five years, but we're going to talk uh, more explicitly uh, about each of them and, and then ramp up the, the communication on, on each of these uh, over, over time. Uh, and, and the three key pillars are, are one, the macro. So that's really the, the setup for the risk-taking environment. Uh, two is the, the fundamental. So you think about things like valuation, earnings, uh, estimates that, that are high right now, but perhaps need to come down. Uh, and then lastly, the, the behavioral. 
So what is the risk appetite? You know, how do people feel? And then, and then more importantly, how are, how are key players positioned? So we'll, we'll talk about those and then, and then ultimately, what does that mean for portfolios? Uh, I'll, I'll get, get ahead of our, ourselves here and, and say that, you know, we are positioned defensively now. We, we have been uh, for, for quite a bit. Um, but what is that going to look like going into 2023? And, and more importantly, you know, what do we need to see to feel comfortable uh, taking more risk? So we'll, we'll briefly uh, summarize the process. I mentioned the three key pillars. Uh, again, this is all stuff that we've, we've been doing uh, for the better part of five years now. We start with the macro, which is the business cycle, and then the quad maps, which is the, the growth in the inflation regimes. We'll, we'll hit on those momentarily. Uh, then we look at the fundamentals. So things like price to earnings multiples, earnings estimates. Uh, what are upcoming market moving events like the, the inflation number this morning? Uh, and the behavior, uh, importantly, how, how do investors feel? Uh, what are flows doing? Where's the risk appetite? Are there any extremes that we can exploit either way? And it's, it's these three pillars that, that guide our decision-making processes, which is on the right-hand side of the, the slide here. So starting with asset allocation decisions, what sector factor exposure on the equity side or uh, sub-asset allocation on, on the fixed income or, or in the alts buckets. Uh, security selection. What are the individual stocks or, or funds that we decide to buy or sell? How do they fit uh, together with what we're trying to achieve? And then, and then lastly, we always look at the portfolio level. So what's the purpose? What, what objectives are, are we trying to, to uh, manifest? Uh, how much risk do we want to take on? And what's the downside? And, and our process uh, is something that we, we spend a lot of time and energy creating and, and implementing and, and talking about each and every day. And and it's all data driven. It's all based on, on sound economic relationships. And it's repeatable, importantly, it's not a flash in the pan. And, and that's what, what gives us our edge. So now what we'll do the review, uh, we'll start with GDP. Uh, so we've, you know, you get a lot of the headlines about two negative quarters of, of real GDP growth, and that's quarter over quarter. Uh, but if you look at it year over year, so what was 1Q22 compared to 1Q21, 2Q22 to 21, so on and so forth, uh, still positive, still growing. Uh, and you typically don't see that in, in quote unquote real recessions. So we, we certainly reject the notion that we are in a recession now, but as we'll see on the outlook, I think the, the odds of a recession next year are, are rising. Uh, then we, we break down the components of GDP. So as you can see, uh, nearly 70% of it is consumption driven. And, and we hit on this during the flash call, so I won't rehash all of it. But, but by and large, consumers, uh, corporations, and financial institutions are all in great shape. They've got money in the bank, uh, very little in the way of, of uh, prohibitive uh, debt service costs. Labor markets are still strong, wages are rising. So that's all good news uh, for now for, for the economy. And, and also gives us confidence that if we do happen to fall into a recession or a hard landing next year, it's likely to be of the, the much more mild variety and, and not something like what we saw in 2008 or perhaps even 2001. So then we, we move on to inflation, which has been the major topic um, of the past 18 months. and and. It was interesting this morning, we got, we got a pretty bad reading uh, that initially jarred the market lower by about 2% uh, before, before rallying back. So, you know, peak to tr trough to peak, we, we got nearly, uh, nearly a 6% intraday move, which is one of the uh, strangest and, and most interesting that, that I can remember. Uh, but this morning's headline number came in at, at 8.2. So lower than last month, slightly, uh, but still much too high for, for the Fed and for their goals. Before we move on, I, I want to call out shelter inflation. This is this dark blue bar uh, on the chart here. This is, this is housing, right? Owner's equivalent rent is, is what the, the calculation is called. And this is the largest piece of inflation of the inflationary puzzle. It's about a third of, of headline uh, CPI and about 40% of, of core CPI. So it's, it's extremely important. And, and we've got some, new, some good news uh, on that front coming uh, here over, over the next few months. And we'll touch on that in a bit. On the right-hand side, we look at long-run inflation expectations. And as you can see over, over five-year periods, uh, looking out into the future, five or 10-year periods, 
they have yet to really come unanchored, which is fantastic. And this is this is really what the Fed, one of their key metrics uh, on the inflation front that they that they keep an eye on because they do not want uh, these long run inflation expectations to become an unanchored, uh, because then you get into a bit of a, a bit of a self fulfilling prophecy. Speaking of the Fed, we spent a lot of time watching uh, watching the the Fed, listening to what they're saying. Uh, trying to read between the tea leaves, if you will. But we've got a graphic here of their main policy tool, which is the Fed funds rate. So that's the, really the foundation of all the interest rates in our economy. And, and just look at the slope of this line, uh, how, how quickly and, and how aggressively that they have tightened. And, and we look back historically, as we often do, to, to understand precedents and, and what, what may be likely to happen in the future. And we found that that if they, they do follow through with the rate hikes that, that they have forecast and, and laid out for us here, uh, which is the, uh, the, the green, I'm sorry, the blue dots, this will be the, the fastest tightening cycle in, in history. Uh, so that, so they're, they're being extremely aggressive trying to cool down the economy to, to combat inflation. So there are some signs that it's working. Uh, however, Fed policy does operate on a lag to the broader, broader economy of about 18 months. So it's still going to take some time to filter through the system. And, and we're anticipating that, that it's going to slow things down quite a bit uh, next year as we, as we go on. And I don't know if you all can see this down here at the bottom. Let me try and move this out of the way. There we go. Um, and then we, we pulled a, a quote from, from the uh, September FOMC meeting for, uh, for Chair Powell. Long story short, again, we touched on this in the flash call. The message unequivocally is, is for the market to get ready uh, for a recession. So we mentioned been, been an extremely challenging time. We look at, at some of the return figures year to date. These are through uh, September 30, S&P down 24. Uh, the, the NASDAQ, so a lot of the growth heavy stocks down over 30%. Uh, what has made this, this year much more painful than normal is, is that bonds have not provided the diversification benefit with, with that we are normally accustomed to. With the 60 40 uh, portfolio, which is the world's retirement portfolio, down uh, over 20% a year to date. You look at the market from a sector perspective, really energy has been the, the lone bright spot up nearly 50. And, and while we have been overweight in, in our tactical portfolios, if you look at every other sector, it's down nearly double digit, down double digits or more, uh, especially in the, in the highly owned uh, you know, retail favorites like technology and communications, where a lot of these FANG stocks are right down 31 and 37% uh, respectively. So you know, these, are, these are favorites of, of many hedge funds, many other financial advisory firms, not named Cornerstone. And while they did provide a pretty nice ride up, there are a lot of people out there right now who are hurting you know, much more than the, the down 20, 23 on the S&P. Uh, so we look at the right-hand side of the chart. This is a 60-40 portfolio made up of the S&P 500 and 10-year treasuries. Uh, and you, you can see as of uh, October 11th, we're down 21. So look at 2008, it's down, down 14. So, so for many investors, this year has actually felt worse than, than 2008. And, and in fact, you have to go all the way back to 1931 to find a year that is, is worse than what we've experienced so far. So you know, Jeff, uh, I don't know about you, but, but for me, that qualifies as once in a lifetime. And, and I know I wasn't doing this in 1931, and, and I don't think you were either, but just I've goes to show just how difficult. have been doing it in the wild, Cliff, been. but uh, not since 1931. Well, we could say 91, but not 31. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the, and, you know, that was when, when you shared that quote, when you shared that chart with me a few weeks back on the 6040, it, it did take me, again, I remember... And I think many do remember that was that was a tough. That was a totally different time. There was a financial crisis that we were dealing with. Again, that not that this is an easy time. This is a different time, but you know that was a uh, you know, banks individuals were leveraging themselves up so high. And like you mentioned, you've got a different consumer, a different financial system. Banks, companies, corporations, etc. Certainly put themselves in 
um, to be in a better position. So thanks, Cliff. Uh, I think it's always good also to review the investment process and reminding clients that, again, the planning, the process, and the patience that we, the three Ps that we continue to follow, we, um, are always going to be uh, paramount. And we've been through this before. So um, I know everybody wants to know, okay, so yeah, the, the past is what, it's not that, what have you done for me lately, right? So let's go into, you know, the outlook and, you know, what we're seeing ahead and I know you're excited to share kind of, I know you've been working hard on this dashboard that you just popped up. So I'll let you take it and uh, talk about the dashboard that you and the investment team put together here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jeff. It's yeah, always uh, eyes forward, all, always. And, and so um, we'll, we'll shift gears and talk a little bit about the outlook and, and introduce the dashboard. And, and please, uh, uh, for those who are, who are watching, uh, give us some feedback. Uh, let your let your advisors know what you think. Uh, we we want to you know we've been looking for for ways to continue to streamline our communication you know, from the investment team to to advisors and and then uh, on to clients just to make sure that we're all on the same page and we're all getting a, a consistent message. So uh, so let us know your thoughts. We, you know this is a, a an iterative uh, document. We want to we want to make it better. We want to make it useful. So so please uh, any feedback is welcome. Uh, and I'll just kind of walk through this here really quickly. So on the, on the right-hand side, you've got the three key pillars, the, the macro, the, the fundamental, and then, and then the behavior. Uh, so within each of these, we, we've got just three high-level indicators that, that we're going to mention and, and report on so that, you know, we talk a lot about the business cycle. We're going to walk through each one of these step-by-step. Uh, -step. Um, the, the quads uh, and then the Federal Reserve, are they, are they easing, tightening, what's their, what's their policy? Um, we'll look at the fundamental. So again, valuation is, is a big component. And we're, we're gonna, we've got some graphics on, on PE ratios, which are actually looking, looking pretty reasonable, kind of in this fair to, to even maybe bullish range. We'll look at earnings, uh, what are earnings to date? And then, and then importantly, what are expectations around earnings? And those are probably gonna have to come down. Uh, and then, and then, lastly, the behavior. So we, we've got a little bit for everyone. So the the retail sentiment. So that really tries to capture the emotions of the market. Uh, we've got institutional positioning. So what are the the key players like hedge funds, large asset managers in in aggregate? What are they doing? Uh, and then, and then, lastly, the options market. And and so we'll want to understand: Is everyone hedged? How expensive is it to buy to buy you know insurance or, or protection, if you will? Um, one last bit, uh, just to note on the behavior, this is a contrarian uh, set of, of indicators. So, so what we're really looking for are extremes. We want to be buying fear or, or when, when institutions are, are underweight or when they're short. And then conversely, we want to be sellers when, when everyone is, is greedy and, and extremely bullish. So again, we're looking for extremes. I think you know, we'll, we'll dive into these and see that you can make an argument that we've got some extreme sentiment readings today. And I, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but uh, you know, could categorize a little bit of a blood in the streets uh, kind of moment here for markets as we go into the fourth quarter. So now we'll just quickly run through these. This is the, the business cycle. It's a visual representation on, on how the economy moves through time on average lasts between seven and 10 years. Uh, so as you can see, we've peaked, uh, we're past the peak from a growth perspective, firmly late cycle, and then heading toward what we think will, will likely be a, a Fed induced, but, but mild or shallow recession uh, in, likely in 2023. So the, just take a, a note of, the, of a couple of things here, the timeframes, right? So late cycle recession are typically shorter parts of the economic cycle. So we're hoping for a, a quick you know, uh, pop in into contraction and then back out to, to growth. And the Fed is going to be a, a key part of, of us navigating through that. Uh, but then also look at the, at the inflationary pressures here, right? So this is color coded. Late cycle, you've got that most intense uh, red color for inflation. We think that's where we are today. And then ultimately, this is going to begin to moderate, We're seeing signs that it's moderating already. So that's going to have pretty massive ramifications for, for assets. Uh, we think it's likely going to, uh, well, well, we'll kind of move ahead and I'll come back to that. Um, this, is, this is the quad map, right? Everyone should be familiar with, with this by now. Uh, so this is just the way that we navigate through rates of change and, and growth on the, 
on the y-axis and inflation on the, on the x-axis. And so we've been in a period of quad three, three consecutive quarters of quad three, where growth continues to decelerate, inflation continues to, to accelerate. Uh, but now we, we think that we are right at this inflection point uh, and we're optimistic that, that it, you know, core inflation has already peaked, uh, which, was, which was this graph here. Um, core inflation has already peaked and is, and is coming down. And that, I'm sorry, headline has already peaked and come down. And now we're, we are uh, just looking forward to core inflation uh, peaking and, and then decelerating. And, and this is going to be, and, and by the way, core just strips out food and energy, which are a bit more volatile. Uh, but this is really important. And, and we think this is going to be the major focus of, of markets going into the fourth quarter and then into 2023. Um, because it's, you know, not only will it change the focus of the market from off of inflation, uh, but, but, you know, toward growth. Uh, but then more importantly, the, the cross asset correlations, i.e. the stock bond relationship, which is you know, they've both fallen together this year. Uh, we think we are, are gonna be nearing a point where bonds really do start to act like that traditional diversifier again. And so, you know, one of the, the key takeaways that we'll hit on is, is now is not the time to, to abandon your bonds because we do think they are gonna start working again. And, and um, why, we're, right? So, so why do we say that? Uh, we think that, that we're getting close to a point again where inflation is about to become yesterday's news. And, and I mentioned on the inflation slide, that shelter component or the owner's equivalent rent, this blue line here, uh, you can see closely follows uh, the Case-Shiller Home Price Index, but on about an 18 month lag. And so as you'll see, you know, we're getting to the point now where we're kind of getting to the front end of, of the peak in, in home price growth acceleration. We may even perhaps see some, some uh, you know, we're already, already seeing deceleration, but we actually may see some, some give back or uh, downturn in housing prices next year, you know, anywhere in the neighborhood of, of you know, five to eight nationally. And, and that'll be obviously very regionally specific, but we're getting to the point where that is now gonna act like an anchor and begin to pull down that, that headline inflation. And so yeah, may, it wasn't this month, obviously, uh, may not be next month, but, but certainly by year end in the first quarter of 2023, we expect to see that deceleration in the shelter component really, really begin to pick up steam. Uh, so then we'll, we'll focus on growth. And, and what I've got here on the right hand side of the chart is the conference board, uh, LEI, the Leading Economic Indicators Index. There are 11 inputs that, that go into this, this uh, data set. They update monthly. Uh, designed to, to give a, an estimate on, on you know, leading indicators of the economy. Um, and, and what we found was that September marked the sixth consecutive month of, of uh, negative month over month change. So that the LEI, LEI numbers have, have fallen six months in a row. And, and when we look back at history, as we often do, we found that at least going back to, to 1981, when we have data, uh, there has, every time that the LEI has fallen for six consecutive months, there has been a recession that has shortly followed. And that's every time, there, there, are, no, there are no head fakes, no one-offs. Uh, so, you know, history rhymes, as they say, it doesn't repeat. Could this time be different? Possibly, but, but given with what we're seeing in, with, with the Fed and, and their actions, uh, we, we likely think that this time is not gonna be different. So then what are we going to care about? What are, we, what are we going to focus on from a macro perspective if it's not inflation? Well, it's really two things. It's, it's housing and, and jobs. Uh, so everyone knows that as interest rates have, have risen, mortgage rates have, have skyrocketed. This is uh, slowing demand and slowing uh, existing home sales. As we can see the, the graphic on the left, we do think home prices are going to, to come under a little pressure uh, next year. But again, nothing like 2008. Uh, just a completely different uh, time and, and completely different setup. Uh, then the other thing is jobs. Uh, that's the, the second most important factor. And, and this highlights uh, relationship, the relationship between some, some small business survey data on hiring plans and then, and then payrolls. And, and as you can see, there's a lag of about five months. And so we do think that we are going to begin to see the jobs market ease a bit. 
Uh, last month, we, we just got the, uh, the jolts data. That's, that's job openings. Job openings, there's still almost two to one for every unemployed person, uh, but they did drop by the most uh, for a given month ever uh, outside recession. So beginning, beginning to see some signs that uh, the labor market may ease, which as we all know, is an, is an explicit goal of the Fed. And so you, know, you, you certainly don't wanna be betting against the Fed. They've got much, uh, much deeper pockets than you and I do, Jeff. No, well, Cliff, thanks for uh, sharing that. And again, the outlook continues, right? We went over the macro, the business cycle, and again, we know the driver and with the quad. So again, we wanted to take that, uh, the quads and maybe add another, you know, the green, red, and yellow in terms of where we're looking. So hopefully, like Cliff said, share some, you know, share some feedback with us on that. So uh, Cliff, let's go into the fundamentals. This is, you know, continue on with the outlook of where we are or going. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. And, and uh, you know, as we saw on the dashboard, the macro is red. The, you know, the story gets better and better as we, as we move along. So that's the good news. You know, we look at the fundamentals, especially valuations, and they actually look pretty, pretty good, pretty reasonable. Uh, so we'll start with the, the forward uh, P.E. ratio for the S&P 500. So that's today's price divided by earn, you know, tomorrow's earnings right, or, or next year's earnings. And so, as you can see, it's come in quite a bit from where we were uh, back, back in, in COVID and you know, coming out of the pandemic. And we are actually now below the 25-year the average uh, for the S&P 500. So that's certainly a, a, a really good sign from a, from a healing and from a valuation perspective. And, and if you look at the chart on the right, uh, you can see that, that over time, uh, and this is over a five-year number, Right, so five-year annualized returns, uh, 15 times uh, multiple, uh, is is really really good for, for long-term investors. You know, you, you get kind of that at 10 to 12 percent annually uh, over a five-year period at, at a at a 15 number. So that's it's great, you know, great setup for the long term, uh, but but certainly does nothing for us in the short term. Valuation is it's not a catalyst, as uh, as we like to say. Um, you know, the, the short and the intermediate term are, are driven more so by the macro and more so by the behavioral, which are why the, they're the other uh, two, uh, two of our, our key pillars, if you will. So how much of the sell-off, you know, there, there are really two, two factors to the sell-off. There's, there's the valuation piece and then there's the earnings piece. And, and that's what this chart on the left here uh, captures. So though the, the S&P uh, at the time of the snapshot was down about 25%, see earnings are, are actually up five and multiples have really done all of the heavy lifting. And so when, when people ask me what's, you know, what's next or, or hey, what's the, what's the big risk or when does, this, when does this stop? We don't know exactly when, it, when it's gonna stop, but, but we can identify what the risks are and then what we, would, you know, what we will need to see in order to take action. And, and that is categorized here by, by the chart on the, on the uh, right-hand side. So these bars are all earnings you know, going back to, to 1988. Uh, actuals are, are gray. Earnings recessions are these green bars. So what happened during previous either real recession or earning, earnings recessionary periods. And then these blue bars are the estimates. And if you think about why this is important, because that, again, going back to that PE, price to earnings, well, if, if the multiple is based on an earnings number in 2023, that's up 8% year over year. When we think we're heading into a recession, you, know, you, you can see how the math doesn't really work out uh, for, for equities if this earnings number actually stays flat or even comes down, which is, which is more, more traditional uh, when, you, when you go into a recessionary period. Now, that being said, not certainly not time to hit the panic button because at, at lower, you know, in the lower growth environment, when you, you go into a recession, interest rates historically and typically come down. And so when rates come down, that gives you more room on the on the multiple back on the upside. So it's a little bit of a could be a little bit of a seesaw action and, and why we think that we're likely to remain to remain volatile. Uh, but really, it's that earnings number that we're going to be laser focused on. And um, and, you know, as everyone should know, you know, earnings are, are a result of, of sales and, and profit margins. So how many of your products can you sell? What do you charge for them? And then how efficient is your business? How much money you know, do, do you make uh, from an earnings perspective uh, from, the, from your operations? And 
So if you break those two components down, sales should be fine, right? So they're, they're nominal. So sales include inflation. And, and while real GDP, which does not include inflation, uh, might show you know, some, some negative numbers quarter over quarter, nominal GDP, which does include inflation, last quarter was up nearly 10% year over year. So another reason why we, we reject this you know, current recession narrative, you don't see 10% nom nominal GDP growth in, in recessions. The problem, however, for earnings happens when your, your input costs, right, things like labor or things like your materials, uh, so on and so forth, rise faster than, than your sales rise, all else equal. That, that causes your, your earnings to come down. So you can see the chart on the right. We are already seeing signs that, that uh, operating margins are coming in. You're seeing some margin compression here. Um, this is a bit of a busy chart, but the, the key takeaway to know is that as, as labor gets more expensive, right, your margins begin to come down. And so we, we anticipate that, that that trend is likely going to continue uh, and, then, and then probably accelerate uh, into 2023. Uh, so, so lastly, um, you know, we'll, we'll do a quick review. We, we did show the slide on, on our flash update uh, a couple of weeks ago, just laying out some key scenarios, both from a soft landing perspective, if we do avoid recession, and then a hard landing uh, perspective if we, if we do fall into a recession. And, and really the, the key takeaway here is that, is that from a market perspective, even in a hard landing scenario, we are much closer to buying than, than we are to selling, right? So the time to sell has, has already passed. You know, we've already made the defensive moves and, and now we're getting ready to gear up to, to play some offense. And uh, you know, now's not the time to get, to get extremely aggressive. Right. Perhaps other than for a, a tactical year end rally, which we're, we're getting more constructive on, especially after today. Um, but but even if and when we do go into a, into a recession, you know, you look at some of these these bearish scenarios on the S&P where we close today around thirty six hundred. So if we uh, we get down to thirty three hundred, thirty one hundred, three thousand. You know, we really look to aggressively buy around these levels, which is you know, about 10 to 20 percent lower in a really bad scenario. So as, as investors and as risk managers, we are constantly looking for for asymmetry. Right. What's the what's the downside risk for given upside? And if you look at this chart, all time highs at forty eight hundred, uh, that's 33 percent upside from where we are today versus you know, 10 to 20% downside in these worst case scenarios, you know, you're seeing that asymmetry that we look for. Um, so you know, Jeff, we, we know that it, it certainly has been a, a rough ride this year, uh, but there are lights at the end of the tunnel. And, and as I mentioned, we're, we're saving the best for last. So we're, we think we're gonna end on some good notes here. Yeah, so, so Cliff, like you said, yeah, it's from, from our uh, red green, right? So we went from the macro looking red a little bit more yellow on the fundamentals. So let's kind of go to the, uh, maybe end on the high note here on the uh, outlook with the uh, with the behavioral, right? Because we know, and this is a great chart, right? We, we the fear and greed, and uh, as you get into this cliff, you know, I think over the, since you know, 2019, markets were positive. 2020, markets were positive, as crazy as the COVID year was. 2021, positive. And when I say positive, we're not three or 4%, we're double digit you know, 10, 15, even 20% positive. So we've had strong, greedy years. And now the fearful, fear has started in, in January 3rd when the markets hit the high and it's been that sell-off down on down. So that fear greed index has been more about fear in 2022 after all the greed of the, you know, three years prior. So let's talk about the, uh, just the behavioral science that we're looking at. Yeah, that's a, that's a great setup uh, there, Jeff. And, and you know, we, we talk about with, with behavior, we want extremes, right? Warren Buffett, one of the greatest investors in history, says you, you buy when there's blood in the streets. And, and there may not be blood yet, but we're getting pretty, pretty dang close. Um, a couple of things on behavior. They are certainly more shorter term in nature. So the, the impact can be measured in months or quarters. Um, but, but the data that we're going to walk through today, uh, alongside the action in, in the market today, you know, was really strong, really positive, uh, certainly has us, uh, more constructive for a, for a year end tactical rally. And I'm going to emphasize tactical, 
right? So we're certainly not calling to make a, a run to, to new all-time highs. You know, before we before we do that, we do think that that again these earnings expectations, which we talked about earlier, are going to have to come down flat, maybe negative year over year. So we're going to be watching for that very carefully. And then the other thing that we're that we're going to need to see for for a new run at, at highs is is the Fed is going to at least have to pause, right? So they don't have to cut rates, they don't have to turn QE back on, but they're going to at least have to stop raising rates. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll see the, the timing on that. Um, but, but ultimately, again, tactically, I think we're, we're set up for a nice bit of a run uh, here in, into year end. And so we'll start with the retail, the retail side. So this is the uh, AAII bull bear index, you know, 22 levels, extremely bearish, right, which is a very good uh, contrarian uh, buy signal. CNN Fear and Greed Index. This is a one that, that uh, clients can keep track of at home. Just Google CNN Fear and Greed, and it actually does a really good job of, of capturing uh, retail sentiment. And we are at the extreme fear level. Doesn't get much worse than, than what we're seeing now. So again, these things capture feelings, right? And and as I said at the kickoff, we you know on the call, we don't do feelings. We feel feelings, but we do process, and this is all part of our of our process. So not only do we want to know how people feel, but we want to know what are they actually doing with, with their money, putting your money where your mouth is, so to say. And, and on the left-hand side, and we talk a lot about this at the IC and, and internally, uh, large uh, hedge funds and, and asset managers are required to report their positions in futures and options data on a weekly basis. Now, it's a little bit of a lag. It's about 15 days old. Uh, but they, they don't move all that quickly. And so there's a lot of value in understanding how they're positioned. You look at this check, the, this graphic here, it goes back to 2013 on the chart. Uh, these are these are extreme levels, right? So, so you look at it, there's a, a, this is the zero line. So there's a net short in futures and options data for large asset managers, even more bearish than at the depths of COVID, right? So, so this alongside with the retail number, alongside the the uh, data we're going to look at on the on the next slide. Just, these are at levels that that have historically marked, uh, you know, short and intermediate term bottoms. And so we we are again are just becoming more and more constructive about the risk appetite out there, and, and would again encourage, you know, folks who are who are nervous and are really thinking about throwing in the towel. Now is now is certainly not the time uh, to do that. You look at uh, leverage, right? So hedge funds that that go long and short. So they buy stock, stocks long, sell stocks short, uh, and then they use leverage or they use debt to, to enhance their returns. You look at it from a leverage perspective, well, they're, they're momentum chasers. They're levered up when times are good and they have, they have very little leverage when, when times are, are uh, like today where, where times are a little, a little thin. Uh, again, going back to, to 2010, uh, extreme extreme positioning in, in hedge fund space. So this is this is bullish. This is all bullish for stocks. Uh, then lastly, on the on the left, what about the machines? Right, we, we talk a lot about about the the machine and, and what what the algos or the systematics are doing. And and for a lot of them, they they buy when things go up and they sell when things go down. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, and, and all this chart is showing is that you know you look at at their, their positioning and, and what they're gonna have to do in different sort of scenarios, whether, you know, whether or not the market stays flat. Um, if the market goes down, they're gonna have to sell a little bit, but most of these things are already at their max net short position. So there's nothing left to sell, right? And, and so you get a couple more days like today where we, where we get some strong rallies and these machines flip they have to buy regardless. They, they are price insensitive. If, if it flips their, their algorithm, they will buy, they will chase, and that will you know, cause others then, then to react and, and could be a bit of a, a, a you know, positive feedback loop, if you will. Uh, seasonality. We, we've talked about this one a couple of times on these calls. So you know, going into the fourth quarter every year, that's the most seasonally strong time for, for stocks even more so in midterms on average, this is going back to 1931, even more so in gridlock, right? When, when you have divided government between the, the White House and the chambers in Congress. And, and right now, uh, that is the, the highest likelihood outcome 
right? The highest probability for, for midterms. And so, you know, there, there are certainly no guarantees, especially as it relates to seasonality, especially as it relates to elections, as we all know, but, but we play a probability game. And, and right now the probabilities for a, for a nice rally going into year end, in, in our opinion, are, are high, are high. So that we can, we can take some positivity away uh, from, from that front. So lastly, Jeff, I've been talking a lot. We'll, we'll kick it back to you here. Uh, what does this mean for markets? What does this mean for, for our portfolios? Uh, likely continued volatility, both to the upside and the downside, you know, today being a, a great example. Uh, late, you know, the economy is late cycle. Recession is becoming likely in the next 12 months, but will likely be shallow. Uh, growth and inflation, uh, key uh, inflation, are going to begin to slow, in, in our opinion, uh, here over the over the coming quarters. So we've we've been positioned defensively. We've we've been um, you know we've had higher cash, uh, defensive kinds of allocations. Uh, but as growth con concerns begin to take center stage, we turn the page on inflation. Uh, we think the the stock bond relationship is going to somewhat normalize, and so that means don't abandon bonds. Uh, they are going to add the diversification benefit. They're paying you great income now. You know, we're near 4% on the 10 year. You can get north of 5% in high quality investment grade corporates. So you're going to get paid to wait uh, in, in bonds and, and in the bond market. Uh, and then on the equity side, valuations look good. Uh, earnings estimates are too high. They're likely going to have to come down. Uh, but we want to see, we want to see those, those yeah, get written down. We want to see the Fed pivot. Uh, and then we'll, we'll get through the other side of this recession and then, and then really get ready to, uh, to, to play some more offense and, and look for uh, return enhancements as we move into, into you know, later part of 23 and 24. So, so uh, bear with us, uh, you know, likely gonna remain a little bit volatile, um, but we think the, the worst of it uh, is, is behind us and, and we, we stand ready to, to change as the data does. So Jeff, with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen. And, uh, no, no, Cliff, you. keep your screen there. Cause I think this is, you know, a lot of clients have been asking, you know, the question, you know, when, when you have days, not like today, right? It's not, what do we do? It's the day, it's the early morning when the futures were down, right? The concern of, you know, how much more, when is this going to, when is this going to turn, right? This is, I think your positioning chart here is really a good reminder that a lot of what um, we're, we're not to be as reactive, right? We, some, there are times we have to react, but we want to be proactive. So a lot of what, and when Cliff says, I see our investment committee, we're already on top of that, right? This is Cliff and the team has already brought down the inherent uh, risk or beta within the portfolio. So uh, you know, I know I've been talking about this with some clients. If, the, if one is the S&P, our portfolios are not in line with that S&P with the risk associated with it. So because of the positioning, the quality, the volatility, the lower volatility stocks that we're using, um, when you look to the fixed income side in early part of the year was the risk was as interest rates were rising was that the longer term uh, interest rate sensitive bonds, the, you know, for every 1% rise, you had about a seven to 8% drop in the value uh, in the pricing of those bonds. Well, we the investment committee made a decision to bring the duration risk in by bringing the duration. So we were not at four, five, six year duration. We were at two, two and a half. That protected the uh, downside risk. Now, then we 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 and we've talked. We may have gone a little early into adding duration back on, but the trade is now starting to work. So in terms of the fixed income, it's you know that's there's been a lot of positioning there. And then, you know, on the alternative side, I know I've had clients, where, where has there been a place uh, that's, you know, give me, give me some bright side. And I think this has been a, the alternative has been a tremendous bright side. When people, when we review your performance or your allocations, we wish we could say we're not down. This, as Cliff mentioned, when you have a market uh, or an economy where growth is dropping, stock prices are dropping, uh, interest rates are rising at the quickest level we've ever seen. The bonds are down 15% when, when they're typically our diversifier, our protector, they, which they did not play. 
the bright spot has been the alternatives. This this was in a portfolio when you, we've 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 pounded the drums a few times and uh, on this because this portfolio has done everything and more than what we've than we've expected of it. It's given us that shock absorber. It's given us the bumpers if at your at the bump you know at the bowling alley, uh, putting the the side rails up for your kids. Uh, you know, this is what it did. It gave us that bump, you know, the bumpers to give us protection because this portfolio is actually is positive. Uh, and Cliff, correct me if I'm wrong, I think through September, I think the numbers were somewhere around two and a half percent on the positive through September um, data that we pulled in. So again, this was the, you know, the area or a bright spot. And for many, many of our portfolios, we did add this in. We we reduced equity exposure in our port. We reduced bond exposure sometimes, and we added this in as an additional diversifier. And it's done. Uh, it's done a lot to help um, reduce some of that downside risk that many portfolios have felt. So, uh, Cliff, again, great job with that alter with you know building that alternative strategy. So. Um, again, you went over a lot. There's always a lot that we go over. So Cliff, I'll just maybe wrap up here. Uh, we did have a couple of questions. So before I, um, uh, Will was asking, you know, one of the questions he had for you, Cliff, you mentioned the Fed does not see inflation uh, on, uh, or does not want to see inflation unanchored. Can you define can, define that on that? What, uh, what do you mean by that un, unanchored from the Fed? Yeah, so the, the expectations become unanchored, right? And so you, you can measure that in a few different ways. Uh, the, the market, uh, the, you know, the way the market prices in long run inflation expectations is through what is known as the break even. So that's the break even inflation rate. And, and if you look over like a, a 10 year, you know, a 10 year inflation break even. So what does the market think inflation is going to average over the next 10 years? It's still only about two and a half, between two and a half and three. Um, so, so the market is, is saying that, yeah, inflation is going to spike, but it's going to settle out so that on average over the next 10 years, it's, uh, it's, it's roughly 3%. So for, for the mathematicians at home, if it's, if it's at, you know, eight now, and it's going to be three on average, that means there's going to be some time where it's below that average number. So that's, that's ultimately the, the what the Fed is trying to, to keep intact. Okay. And, and Cliff, uh, Chris was asking about, you know, uh, with the Fed, you know, the Fed's mandate uh, of inflation, you know, at 2%, we're going to give the Fed a, an F minus, uh, I don't know if you can get below the F, but not doing a great job, as we all know, a little too, too late and too quick right now. But the other part of their mandate is, is in, uh, employment, which we will, you know, employment uh, or unemployment has been three and a half, well, came in at three and a half percent. Now, again, the jolts and looking at all the data behind it. So uh, I guess Chris was asking, is anyone predicting or uh, looking at unemployment rising? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I would say just about everyone uh, it, you know, who forecasts or, or in the markets is expecting unemployment to, to rise. Um, and we, we talked about this during the, the flash update last week, but, but if you look at the, uh, here, I can, I can share this really quickly. Uh, if you look at the Fed's economic projections on unemployment rate, they, they think we're gonna, so we're, like Jeff said, we're at three, five now. They think we're gonna end the year at three, eight. Uh, again, this is unemployment. And then we're gonna tick up in 23 and 24, we're gonna go from a, from a trough of three, five up to four, four, which if you, if you run the numbers on that, that's about a million and a half lost jobs that they're telling us they expect and they are comfortable causing uh, to, to happen in the economy. Uh, history says they, they, that their forecast is, is ludicrous. Uh, there, there has actually never been a, an increase in the unemployment rate of, of 0.5%. So let's just say we go from three and a half to four. There's, there's never been a time in history where it's, where it's only gone up to say that, you know, seven tenths or nine tenths, and then comes back down. Every single time it goes up at least two additional percent. So again, running the math, that's 3 million jobs lost. And then on average, which includes the global financial crisis, it's a bit skewed. On average, you're talking 3%. 
increase before it comes back down. So, so that's, that's almost 5 million jobs. Uh, we're, not, we're not forecasting that by any means, but there's, there's no question that the employment picture is going to get, is going to get worse, uh, unfortunately, uh, next year. Thank, thanks, Cliff. Hey, uh, with just our, I'm going to try and just share a little bit of some financial updates. I know we went a little longer on the investment, uh, which is great. And thank you for your time, Cliff. And, and you mentioned your flash update, just a reminder on that flash update as well. That is on our website. Uh, it was Cliff, I think you did that what right after the Fed or about a week after the Fed meeting, just some thoughts on uh, follow up on the Fed and some of Powell's comments, et cetera. So it's on the website. If you want to take a look or we can send it to you, just reach out, let us know. We'll send it out to you again. Uh, a couple big announce. Well, big announcement this morning for those that are collecting Social Security. Uh, good time to talk with your advisor, but Social Security should is going up and going to get a big bump. Uh, about eight. Well, not about eight point seven percent rise for twenty twenty three in Social Security payments. So a large increase uh, in Social Security. Um, we all know, and as Cliff mentioned on that chart too, within with the interest rate charts moving up, we've all seen. Uh, from a housing perspective, mortgage rates went from where they were at the end of 2021 at about 3% on average to now close to seven. And Matt Sandberg, was we were talking the other day and he shared that's about a 50% increase in payment uh, from, uh, in from 2021 to where we would be today. So uh, a big jump across uh, from a mortgage uh, or mortgage perspective in a monthly payment. Um, you know, the President Biden did sign into um, into law the IRA or the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, not IRA is retirement, but Inflation Reduction Act. Just quick highlights, that was a lot to involve with clean energy credits, um, looking to lower Medicare prescription costs, setting a minimum tax on corporations at 15%. And then it also from a corporate for corporations that are looking to buy back their stock because that's a big part of you know, corporate buybacks. There is going to be a 1% fee that corporations will pay. Um, you know, year end reminder, if you're over 72, you do need to be taking your required minimum distributions or RMDs. Uh, again, at this time, if you have not talked to your advisor, a lot of the required minimum distributions, we have them set automatically to be paid out be moved to an individual or a joint account. But if you don't have that uh, on automatic, you make sure you're talking to your advisor. I'm sure if, if we have it on file, we'll be talking to you before anyway. Um, also regarding 401ks, the max to put into a 401k, if you're under 50, 20,500. But if you're over 50, you can do additional 6,500. So make sure you're, if you have the ability, make, use that catch-up contribution. That contribution allows you to give uh, enough, that 6,500, bring you up to 27,000. Uh, and if you're unable to, if you don't have a 401k, you're just doing an IRA. Uh, if you're under 50, 6,000. If you're over, you can do up to 7,000. So make sure. Now with the 401k a little different, we have to have those funded by the end of the year. IRAs, we can put those in through tax time. So you got a little bit more time to worry about that. Um, but again, RMDs do need to come out. If you don't, uh, mentioning that there's a pretty good penalty for not taking out 50%. Um, Cliff and the investment team has been hard at work creating some and doing some tax harvesting. A lot of times we do this at year end, try and make sure we're as tax efficient in our portfolios as possible. Uh, over the last few years, it's been tough uh, because there has not been a lot of losses across many sectors. So um, this year is gonna be a lot, it's, it's a different year. We've been able to take some losses and bank those losses. Um, if you're paying estimated tax payments, not gonna say don't pay your uh, fourth quarter, but could have a conversation with your accountant or CPA um, get your, you can ask your advisor to, to send over your, un, uh, your realized gains and loss report and really see what you're, what you're on track for. Um, good also time if when before year end to either bunch uh, itemized deductions or expenses that you're able to take. If you can take them in a year, maybe one year or bring them together in one year versus spreading them out over two years, could be more tax efficient from a charitable perspective. 
Um, if you're having a really good year and you it may be a good time to push uh, those the in, some income into the next year if possible, or even pull it into this year if you're not having a great year. If it's a lower bonus year, commission year, or income year, good time to review that. Um, lastly, just kind of talking about, uh, and you've heard many, myself or other advisors talk about Roth conversions, great time to continue reviewing, doing a tax, we can do a tax projection to show you the impact of converting 50,000 or 100,000, 10,000, whatever it may be, we can run various scenarios to help you make good a good decision on could a Roth contribution or a Roth conversion be beneficial to me, especially again, as I mentioned, just the year that we're in from a tax perspective. We don't know if they're gonna keep the Roth conversion forever, we hope they do, um, but, we don't also want to get caught that they change the rules on us and you're not able to do it. So make sure you take a, take a look at that, see if that fits into your situation. Uh, Cliff, I think we're going to wrap it up there. I want to thank you for your time. Thanks for putting all that information together. Um, again, thanks to the investment team with everybody. I know a lot of hard work continues behind the scenes. Um, of course, want to thank everybody that joined us today. Um, if there's any additional questions, again, please feel free to call the office. Uh, call your advisor, call myself, be happy to take a call and uh, chat with you about any markets, financial up, tax updates, whatever it may be. Um, you know, Let us know what you think about the dashboard. Yeah, tell us. Thank you, Cliff. Remind, give us a little feedback on that dashboard. Love to love to hear it. Um, you know, on behalf of the Cornerstone Wealth team, we want to thank you for your time. We want to thank you for your continued trust and confidence. Uh, you've placed in our team. We, it is never and will never be taken lightly. So we appreciate you all. I uh, hope we all talk to you before Thanksgiving and certainly the holidays. If we do not, have a wonderful, safe Thanksgiving. Have a ho happy holiday season. But we'll look forward to talking to everyone soon. Have a great day and have a great rest of the week. Thank you, everyone.